Uh, this session is called uh, Enabling Single Sign-On to Windows Azure Applications. My name is Harvey Wilson. I'm presently an architect at Microsoft. I was, in fact, the development manager for the Windows Identity Foundation for ADFS 2.0 and for Cardspace 2. I'm presently just started a new role. I'm now the architect for the App Fabric Access Control Service. So I've spent a long time, a lot of career and a lot of years burned on claims-based stuff. So for the next hour, I'm going to cover basically two things. I want to spend a little time talking about externalizing authentication. And I'll do a quick recap on what the Windows Identity Foundation and Active Directory Federation services are. Um, but I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that piece. I want to spend most of my time talking about single sign-on to Windows Azure with those products. And so I'm going to do some demos. I'm going to write some code. and. In fact, there are no demos. I'm just going to write code, and hopefully it will all work. Um, and there's some details in there, things that we discovered uh, when we started this exercise, which was admittedly a few months back as we were trying to shut down the Windows Identity Foundation. And suddenly we said, oh, we really need to make this thing work in Windows Azure. So being me, I beat on the dev team for about three or four weeks, and then I beat on them some more, and they fixed up some stuff. And, what was really cool about it is my presentation here just shrank and shrank and shrank. My only real goal for this is at the end of the day, you guys go away and you understand that WIF, Windows Identity Foundation, just works in Windows Azure. So to get that kicked off, I'm going to quickly show an app I wrote. This was uh, my attempt to get the team started. And so what you see here is a, a browser pointed at a website that, oops, I don't want that. Up at the top left you can see is an app that we actually deployed up into Windows Azure. This is running in production. It's been hanging around for quite some time. Um, all it's intended to show is that this stuff works. Ordinarily, when you see single sign-on, you expect to land on some website and it automatically redirects you. I actually changed this app. I wanted to give people a chance at work to read the text and say, OK, this is enterprise single sign-on to an ADFS site. The ADFS server that we are using here is hosted by the Microsoft IT group. So we have an ADFS2 instance already running on the edge of our network, and we use that for a wide range of applications. So what I'm going to do here is click to sign in. Now, of course, I'm not on our intranet. So at this point, I have to be prompted for credentials. So if I enter my domain account in here, if I can remember my password, and what you get back is some information about me that you can only recover from Microsoft's Active Directory instance. So my name, obviously, my photograph. At Microsoft, we all store our pictures inside AD, and that's how we get the pictures to appear when I get email from different people. And you can go and set your own crazy character. So the point about this app is this is an app that could have been an app that you deployed and built on your intranet that you then took and pushed out into Azure. And you still want your employees to be able to access it using their ID authentication. So how many people here have been to some of the other identity talks in particular? Has anybody been to Vittorio's session that ran about 11.30 this morning? And how many people are familiar with the message we've been giving about claims-based identities and stuff? OK, that's great. So hopefully you know this stuff by rote already. There are a couple of things that we push when we talk about um, our identity story. The first is externalizing authentication. So take authentication out of your application. Let some single server somewhere worry about that problem. And give our administrators, IT pro staff, one place where they can think about accounts, adding new accounts, provisioning them, setting permissions, um, and removing them should the worst happen. So we start our picture here with a an application down in the right-hand corner, and it has a little triangle on it to say, hey, I'm a service. And of course, in very typical fashion with most of our applications, we put an account store on it. So the first thing we really want to do with that is 
add this other node that we'll call an identity provider, and we'll steal the account store away from the application. So now at this point, this app is kind of stuck. It can not really authenticate anybody. So the way that it's going to learn about users and understand them is that we'll establish a trust to the identity provider. And that trust is basically a cryptographic arrangement. It says that if I get some blob of data about a user signed with this key, then I'll believe it's true. And I'll make some claims from that stuff, and then I'll do my normal app thing. And so the way this mechanism works, as in all systems, is usually a client. In the identity work that we do, that client can be a browser. And that's what I'm largely going to show today. Um, it could be a more active client. If anybody's familiar with Windows Card Space, that's an example of a, another authentication client that would work for a rich application rather than a browser situation. So what happens is the user logs on to this identity provider, and the identity provider does the authentication thing. So it can take a username, password, or an X509 certificate, or a Kerberos ticket, and so on. And it authenticates the user and says, hey, you really exist in the account store. Now what I'm going to do, now I know you're visiting this relying party, I'm going to collect together some data about you. And I'm going to transform that, perhaps. And I'm going to call all that data uh, claims. And when I'm done with that stuff, I'm going to send it back to you. Now the claims, of course, have to be packaged security. And this is where you see a security token. So just think about a security token as a packaging of claims. They come in lots of different forms. What the identity provider will also do is establish a session. So in the case of the web, the identity provider here usually sends back an HTTP cookie. And what that will mean is if I go to a different relying party and I'm redirected and bounced back to my identity provider, that cookie will already be there. I won't need to re-authenticate. I won't need to re-enter my password. It will then generate a new set of claims for the new target application. And I'll be bounced back. And so we present those claims to the relying party. And because they're in a security token, somebody has to do some work to figure out what the heck's a security token. Is this cryptographically secure? Is it sound? Extract all the claims out of that stuff. Probably establish a session. And for ASP.NET, that's typically a bunch of HTTP cookies that are sent to the client. And then the requests go backwards and forwards. So I navigate around web pages, and this cookie goes up and down, and the app always knows who I am and what's going on. And so when we think about that, the point about this session is to be able to take that app that we've talked about for the Windows Identity Foundation and identity is like on-premise. I want to take the app and put it into the cloud, Windows Azure in this case. And so I'm going to build the application using the Windows Identity Foundation. And I'm going to use ADFS2 for my identity provider. So a few words about those. We RTM'd Windows Identity Foundation yesterday. Um, it's been a long time coming, but I'm pretty pleased with the result. It's a great one. -out. Um, the whole purpose of this was to build a set of extensions to the .NET framework that enabled our new thinking about identity. So we focused on building ASP.NET websites and WCF services. And one of the things that we thought was super important around all of this was how would we expose claims and stuff to developers? So we took the existing iPrincipal and iIdentity interfaces that live inside .NET, and we subclassed those. We supported all the same properties and methods, and then we added bags of claims to things. And then we thought, oh, this is cool. Well, people do all these principal permission stuff with this enroll. Can we do it with has claim? And so we added some principal permission classes to enable that. And the one big thing that we really wanted to do was, in this framework was to just make it so that you didn't have to understand or write code for the protocols. It's important that you understand how your app basically works. It's important to understand that because there's security issues involved. But I didn't want to have to make all of you customers think about exactly how the protocol worked, exactly what it was a well-formed SAML 1.1 token, and how should it be signed, and how would we package the claims, etc. So we jammed all that stuff down into, the, uh, into WIF. Um, so along with supporting building an application, it also lets you build STSs, identity providers and federation providers, security token services. Now, having had this great idea, we'll build this framework stuff. What's the best thing to do to test your framework? Is to take your Premier Federation server and build it on top of the framework. So for ADFS2, we basically stripped the thing down to nothing and started over. And we started with WIF and we built on top of that. So a great deal of the capabilities that you find in ADFS2 
are there because they are inherited from the framework. Um, ADFS does some new things as well. You should think about it really as a custom STS built on top of WIF with all the things you'd think of in a Windows Server role. So all the Windows Server pieces, all the MMC console, um, all the scripting support, all the management pieces around it. Um, the one big thing that we did as a departure from our previous stances was to add the SAML2 pro protocols to this thing. We had huge demand from customers. So now ADFS2 speaks IDP Lite and SP Lite and some of the year government profiles. And inside the middle of it, we thought about, well, hang on, I've got these claims coming in and claims going out, and what am I going to do with all this stuff? So we built this rules-based claims transformation engine that lives inside ADFS. So you can write rules about what to do with incoming claims, how to transform them, and they can simple regular expression stuff. You can reach out to stores. So you can reach out to AD, you can reach out to AD LDS, and you can reach out to SQL Server databases. And if you have another store that isn't supported by one of those adapters, go write your adapter, go install it into ADFS, and now you can use the same policy transformation engine to reach your stores and get more claims. So we try to offer as many options there about how do I take that account store out of my app and move it across to the identity provider. Um, for those of you who were in Vittorio's session, you saw him draw the diagram with the identity delegation, the act as token. And that's fully supported in ADFS. And of course, it's got the same old proxy that we had with ADFS v1 lives out on the DMZ. And if you map between these two servers correctly, then out on the extranet, you'll be the username, x 509 certificate prompting on the intranet, your Kerberos Windows integrated auth. So, what I'm going to do now is try and do all this from scratch. So, here's my blank copy of Visual Studio. So let's set about creating a new project. And of course, what I'd like to do here is create a new Windows Azure project. So I'm going to give this one a name, and it's cloud service. And I'm going to add an ASP.NET role to that. And I'll make this simple. I'll just call this one web role. So I'm sure, I hope most of you have worked inside the Windows Azure stuff inside Visual Studio. So what you can see at the top right hand corner is the standard Windows Azure container for my app and then the application below is a stock web application template. Um, and at this point I need to do a little bit of configuration to get this application working. So what I want to do here is go to the properties for my roles and I'm going to start at the bottom. So I care about certificates. The thing about all these federation protocols is they're all really around security. And so one of the hard parts of, of all of this, and particularly even working with Windows Azure, is there are certs and keys all over the place. And so I have some words later on to think about how you, how you might think about managing some of those things. So let's add a certificate to my application. I'm going to pick one that I already have. And I'll give it a name. I don't care about local storage, I do care about endpoints. I don't want HTTP, I want to be HTTPS. If you're doing any web-based SSO stuff, then things are bouncing around in the browser and they're carried in HTTP messages. You really want those to be secure. If I can get your token and play it again, I am you. It's all over. So you have to be turning on SSL for this stuff. And I'll use my certificate that I picked earlier. I don't have any environment. I have to configure this thing to run full trust. I'll mention this again later. The Windows Identity Foundation is kind of late to the game. We're not part of the VM image for Windows Azure. We are therefore not part of the .NET framework. We're not in the global assembly cache. We do not have full trust. So you cannot use us in a partial trust model. Um, so your Windows Azure app here has to run as full trust. Um, and that will do for my configuration here. Okay. So we're in reasonable shape. Now I'd like to take this app and I'd like to join it to my ADFS server. So to do that, I'm going to add a reference to an STS. The 
the URL I've just typed in is, oftentimes people view this as the physical address, the endpoint URL where the app's going to reside. That's certainly one way to look at it. I tend to look at it more like the name of my application. So even though as I go through the dev and the staging and the production environments for Windows Azure, this could be the static constant name of my application. So I'm going to use an existing SDS. And what I have running, and we'll switch to in a minute, is an ADFS2 server running on a separate VM down on the machine down here. And what I did was type in the name of the SDS, and then I asked it to test the location. So if all goes well, <laughs> don't you hate this when this happens? OK. So when you say test, <laughs> sigh of relief. Um, when you say test location, what the uh, FedUtil tool that I just used does was reach out, try and find the Federation metadata document on that server. And this document has a whole bunch of things in it. At the top, you can see that there is a signature, uh, signature value, and then there's a series of role descriptors. Essentially, this is to tell me everything I need to know about that ADFS server so I can figure out how I'm going to trust it and how I'm going to federate it with it. So let's put that away. I'm going to disable cert chain validation here. Typically in a production environment, you kind of want that turned on. Um, it is quite possible that some STS services will use self-issued keys and so on, so there are places where you may want to turn it off. In general, it's a good idea to leave it turned on. And I want to enable encryption. So I'm going to pick my cert. In case you haven't run into this before, there's a couple of things going on here, a couple of certs. Obviously, there's my SSL certificate. And so you might be asking, well, what do you need this other one for? Well, it turns out you don't actually need the other one. But if you care about the contents of the security token that contains all the claims, and you care about those being hidden away from users, and so that nobody else can capture them and look at them and read the data about your users, then you may want to encrypt the tokens that the STS issues. And so that's all this does. It will tell the STS how to encrypt tokens for me. Here's a list of the claims that the ADFS2 instance supports. So there's a, a general range in here of interesting things, some of which come out of SIDS, um, some of which are just out of AD itself. You can extend the claims that are supported, obviously. OK, at this point, my app believes that it's federated. So if we scroll to the bottom of my web config, you should be able to see a section there that says Microsoft.identity model. Within here is all the configuration settings for my app for the Windows Identity Foundation. So this thing is now set up, and it thinks, I'm not going to log on users. I'm going to send you over to this other place. And the other place that it would like to send you it will be my ADFS server. OK. So now I'm done with my app side of things. Let's switch over to my ADFS server. This is a pretty recent build of ADF ADFS2. How many people have got the ADFS2 beta 2 release and played with it? OK, a few people. So this is the management console, the MMC snapping for ADFS2. And it's running on another VM, which happens to be a domain controller as well. And there are various, obviously, settings within here that I can set up. The things that I, vast range of endpoints here. You can see all of the WCF endpoints there and the various trust versions and the various authentication modes that are supported. Some of you are staring at it, so I'll give it a quick, see if I can get in closer. No. So there's a long list of endpoints there. What I care about is relying parties here. So there's one already hanging around, but what I want to do is add a new one. So my app knows about the SDS, now teach the SDS about the app. So let's add a trust to that. So I'm going to import a federation metadata file. When we ran that FedUtil tool, not only did it do the configuration, it generated some federation metadata, some information about the app. So let's go browse for that. Oops. my Federation metadata document. 
So now ADFS knows about my application and it's setting up that relying party piece. And I'm going to say all users can access this site, this relying party. I could choose to configure some authorization rules here, which will let me prune down the number of users that could actually visit this app that we built. And the first thing it lets me do is edit some rules. These are the rules whereby I decide what data comes out of AD and gets packed in a claim and packed in a security token and shipped out. So let's add some rules here for our application. I want to send some LDAP attributes as claims. I could send a, a range of things here. There's group membership, transforming and coming claims, pass through. This is a simple editor over the policy language that we built. You can, of course, get down to the policy language itself and go to an advanced mode and type in whatever you would like. Um, I would like to use Active Directory and I'm going to pull out my display name and I'm going to send that as the claim type name. I would like to pull out my email address and send that as email address. And so now ADFS knows about that app that we just built. Let's go back to our code. So, this is great, but I haven't done any work yet. My app knows about the SDS, my SDS knows about the app. What am I going to do with this bag of claims? What's the programming model for this thing? So what I'd like to do here is add some stuff to our page so I can display some of the claims. So. Let's stick a couple of labels on the page. I'm going to call the first one name. I'm going to call the second one email. Then I'm going to go into the code for the page and use some of the programming model for, for WIF to try and extract the claims and display them on the page. So, so if I have an I claims principle, uh, oops. Ah, the one thing I always forget, <laughs> the one thing I have to do is add a reference. And the reference I need here is to the WIF assembly. And of course, I said earlier, because we don't exist inside the Azure VM, the best way to get our this assembly package with your app is to set this to copy local true. That will make sure at build time, our app goes in the bin directory, the DLL goes in with it. When Azure packages all this stuff up and ships it up, the Windows Identity Foundation will go with it. At this point, I should be able to resolve this. So I can just use the user object on the page. That will get me the principal object. I actually want to dig down a bit further into the iClaims identity. I have to do uh, one of the costs of subclassing the iPrincipal and the iIdentity interfaces is that you get trapped a little bit in some of the downcasting. As we go forward in future releases, we'll find ways of actually integrating much deeper with the framework so that we can avoid some of these problems. Um, so that's that name label. And I'm just going to pick up the name from the iIdentity. Um, and let's pick up this email claim here. Um, Okay, so what I've asked for here is 
the first to the bottom of the screen, ICI.claims, which is a collection of claims for the user's identity. I want the first one that matches claim type email. Okay, that should be everything. So I've just built that application, and now I'm gonna cross my fingers and do the dangerous thing and press F5. So what we see first going on is, down at the bottom left of the screen is Azure is packing this up, it's starting up the dev fabric for us. And in a moment what we should see is a browser window pop up. And it's trying to connect to my application. It blinked for a moment, and then it took me to my app in the sky. <laughs> um, and so, that's how quick and simple it is to get this application up and running. Um, I want to go and change that. What happened there is that it redirected to my app in Azure. I apologize for that. It should have redirected us to our page. I'm going to show it again later and we'll make that work. Um, but literally, what I tried to show you there was beginning to end, a whole bunch of steps, create the application, federate it from the application side, and then join it to ADFS and set this thing up. Okay, as we went along working with a, a number of these things, um, there were a series of things that we discovered about working with Windows Identity Foundation in Azure. There was some basic stuff and there's some stuff to do with um, web farm session management and caching and transforms and some thoughts that we have about dev and staging and production that we should talk about. Um, when we did session management, we were obviously trying to write this idea that you would arrive with a token full of claims and we would pack them in a bag and we would send them down to the client. And we'd already seen a, already seen a model for that, which was WCF based. And WCF uses a thing called secure conversation. And we kind of created a model using HTTP cookies. Very recently, we took both those models and collapsed them together. Everything to do with sessions is managed as a session security token. And this is a logical session. Um, it contains basically the principal, the identities, and the claims. And sometimes a thing called the bootstrap token. The bootstrap token is the thing you'll need if you ever do act as. When I first arrive at a website, I have this full SAML token. WIF takes that, makes a bunch of claims. The claims themselves are good enough. If later in my app I want to act as the user, I will need that bootstrap token to talk to the SDS, to turn it into a delegation token, to talk to the back-end service. By default, we turn that thing off. Now, confusingly, when we come to session management, we have cookie mode and session mode. Um, they both mean slightly different things. Cookie mode means that when I build this session object with all the data in, I'm going to send it all the way back down to the client, and it's going to keep coming back on every request. That makes my server stateless, and that's pretty important if you're running inside a farm. Who knows where that user is going to hit when they come back? Um, the cookie mode will always work in a web farm, and it usually is best per performance because you don't have the I.O. back to the database. It's the one that we recommend. It's turned on by default for ASP.NET mode. You have to tweak some WCF bindings to get that one into cookie mode. WCF defaults to session mode. You have to use this one for WCF. Try as we might, we could not wire our way right inside the internals of WCF and get that to run in session mode um, across multiple machines. Now, session mode, we try to keep that state up on the server. And obviously, we're going to have to stick that in some kind of shared database. And this mode is recommended for ASP.NET if you get your cookies too big. So if the claims you have about users plus the bootstrap token get so large that you exceed the HTTP header size, you'll have to start caching this stuff server side. Um, we don't, in the product, provide a cache that goes to a database. We do actually have a bunch of samples to do this. Um, there's an abstract class that implements a security token cache. The default one in the product is the MRU security token cache. And that one really isn't going to work for you when you're running a web farm. And as we all know, Azure makes web farms incredibly simple. That thing isn't in memory. So to do a new session mode cache, you'll need to write a new implementation. There's a particular class which is the key. It tells you what's going on. It tells you the context, which is the session ID, the key generation, and an endpoint ID. And the session token is always a session security token. 
And on that cache, there's a pointer to an owner object. And the owner object is the thing called the token handler, the thing that looks after that type of token. And you're going to need that one because what you're going to get is a CLR object and you need to turn it into a bunch of bytes if you ever want to stick it in a database. Now, the other thing that we do is when you're running in cookie mode, all of this data needs to be protected. And so there are a series of session transforms um, that are used to protect that cookie data. And once again, this was kind of a late lesson. The defaults for WIF are compressing the token and using DP API um, for protection. This is all great and fine on a single machine, but DP API is not going to work for you in a web farm. So there's a couple of alternatives you can use. And one of those is the RSA protection. Um, and for that, you can steal your SSL certificate for your application or that encryption certificate that I configured earlier. Or we have a sample for ASP.NET which uses machine key. Has anybody used the machine key thing? Machine key thing is a blob of bytes sitting inside your web config file. And you could configure that through IIS. And we take that blob of bytes and we use that as an AES encryption tree. The cool thing about that is it's all in web config. So when you build this package that contains web config and you throw it onto all these machines, they all got the same key. It makes it incredibly simple. Um, you can set up these things through web config or programmatically. Um, web config has some limitations. And so you'll probably have to subclass the session security token handler to get this to work, or you can do it programmatically. And of course, all this stuff works for on-premise as well. So if you're deploying in a web farm on-premise, you'll need to use some of these same techniques. OK, if I can get my demo box back. Now I'm going to cheat. Because my last app didn't quite work. <laughs> I'm going to open the one I did earlier. So what I did to change some of this configuration was I added a global ASAX class to my app. And when the application starts here, one of the things that WIF will do is provide a static class where you can hook up some events. So I picked up an event that said, oh, the service configuration has been loaded. And I wired that to an event handler. And in the top of that event handler, I created some new transforms. So I picked up the deflate one, which is part of WIF, and then I picked up an RSA cookie transform. And that one I pulled here, you can see, pull it from the service configuration service certificate. That's a piece of WIF configuration, that's the encryption certificate I pulled. Now I can take the data that is going down in the cookie token, I can compress it, and I can protect it with an RSA key. And then in the next few lines of code, I rebuild the session security token handler. And so I use those transforms, and I use a cache. And this particular cache is one that we wrote that backs to Azure Table Storage. And then I replace the security token handler. There was one other thing that I had to do. Down in begin request, I found the session authentication module here and I flipped it into session mode. So let me go and quickly. This is my token cache. I want to quickly try and see if I can set a breakpoint on here. This is a fairly simple method inside it that we wrote. This is all sample code. We'll be giving this out. So this creates a session table. This stores the token away. And it serializes the object. And so you can see here, a serializer. A serializer is something I got from the session token handler. I can use a serializer to serialize my token, get a bunch of bytes. So let's try running this version. OK, so now my breakpoint. I'm inside my cache here. We can see that the key is a security token cache, a bunch of endpoint IDs, a bunch of data, and there is a security token here, which is just a session security token. And so this code, if I ran from here, will go and store that blob of data, all that claims, out inside an Azure table. 
If I were to open up more tabs, this thing would go and fetch the token back from the database so that I can run this in a web form. Some other things that we learned. I said earlier that the protocols that we have are very crypto busy. And if you've ever worked in the dev and the staging environments and the production environments for Windows Azure, you'll realize that an awful lot of that stuff changes. When you saw me press F5 and run inside the development environment, my endpoint address was 127.0.0.1. Um, and when we go to the ADFS server, it needs an address to redirect back to. Um, and in fact, that's the bug, the one step I didn't do in my demo. Um, and all of this stuff keeps changing, and of course all of it has a very big impact on the way the protocols work. And so when you sit down and you're thinking about, okay, I'm gonna build this app, it's gonna run in Azure, and I wanna do the federation thing, there's a, a range of things that you'll need to, to think about, and all of this has a big impact on the protocol. We did an awful lot of work, over, particularly over the last couple of weeks, to try and resolve a number of things here. What we concluded was there really was no one-size-fits-all answer. It all depends on your development processes and your environment. We came up with three main options here. One I'll call protocol tweaks. And has anybody done the hands-on lab um, for the WIF in Windows Azure? Okay, when you do that, you'll see us using this particular protocol tweak. And you can do multiple configuration files or some dynamic stuff. The things you need to think about are, is this app a different instance as it moves through those environments? And that's how I tend to think about it. The app that I'm running for development purposes is actually a different app than the one I run in staging. And when I flip it over into production, it's a different app again. And so you can think about those as different relying parties. And does each deployment use a different STS. So it's great when we're all sitting in our development environment, you've got five or 10 developers working together and they're all pounding away on an STS, but that really isn't gonna be your production STS when you deploy. And so when you take that app and you have to move it along through the environments, you'll have to change a number of the configuration options. So let's look at those quickly. The protocol tweaks thing is really kind of a limited thing. It only works for um, a de development test environment. So I started in development and I've called my app, myapp.cloudapp.net, and I've got this address which is 127.0.0.1444. And of course I'm bound to a particular SDS, I've got one set of metadata and that's all dependent on the certificates that I'm using. And I've got this web config and we saw in web config that there was this Microsoft identity model section. And of course there are a couple of configuration files for Windows Azure. Now as soon as I take that to staging, I, I'm pretty limited here. If all I'm gonna do is mess with the protocol, I end up having to call it the same name. I get this strange address that's generated when you push deploy and you go to staging. So I have to think about that. And what that's gonna to mean to me is only after I've deployed my app will I know the reply address for this redirection protocol. So then I'll have to go to my ADFS and type that in. And once I've changed that for this fixed name of the app, the dev version won't work because I'm in staging now. And when I hit that single STS and I say I'm app A, wants to redirect to my staging address, not to my dev address. And then of course you can push the whole app out to production again, and it's a fixed name. Um, and the same kind of thing applies. Once I change those redirection addresses, the staging app is now pretty much inaccessible. So everything except the hosting addresses is constant and you can mess around with the W reply and the applies to parameters for the identity provider. This is all fine for a custom SDS or testing, but ADFS doesn't do this. The other strategy you can do is multiple configuration files. So we can start out in our dev environment and we can say, oh, this is my app, it runs on this local address, which is the dev fabric, it's bound to a dev.identity.sts.com. And I have a dev version of the metadata file, I have a dev version of web config, I have a dev version of the csdev file, and I have a dev configuration file. And then when I'm gonna push the button and take this to staging, I'm gonna rebuild the app. All my configuration files all changed. All my names all changed, so I'll have to repackage that app and push it up to staging. And then when I push to production, I'll have to do the same thing. I have to have copies of all these files. 
and I have to repackage the app. The one limitation that you get from this model, I mean, it depends on your environment. If it's best for you to manage separate files and you have a, a smart build system that can rebuild for a particular model, then you can suck in the different files. The one gotcha really is that that package that went up to, de to deploy to staging, and you know the little circle, and you press the circle, and it switches the DNS names over? You can't do that anymore. Because you're going to need to rebuild for production to point at all your production systems. And so in this model, all of the configuration can change, but you can't do that fast piece of switching. And then the last one is the one that I like best, but can be a little tricky to get working for all cases. So in this one, I want to have everything different again. Now, the one thing that you'll notice that I've changed here is that in my web config file, I've just said there's one web config, and I've got this parenthetical dev behind it. And in staging, I'm going to stick with all the same files, and I'm going to add this dynamic metadata piece. And in my csdef file, which is interestingly where most of the certificate information is stored, I'm going to have to have all the certs for all the environments. And then I'm going to try and dynamically switch this thing between configurations as we go along. And the goal here is basically to have all of the configuration changing and allow you to fast switch between staging and production environments or dev environments. But the one gotcha is you're going to have to deploy all the certificates. Because they're all in a single CSDEF file, you're probably going to have to deploy your dev certificates, your staging certificates, and your final production certificates up as part of your subscri subscription ID and service name as part of your account. Um, there are a couple of ways to do the dynamic thing. You can do it inside configuration files, and I'm going to try to do that in a moment. You can, of course, do it programmatically. One of the nice things about the Windows Identity Foundation is that we, we made as much as possible be public and virtual, and you can go party with the thing. If it doesn't quite fit your scenario, you tear it apart and do stuff with it. So what I can do here as part of configuration, I can set up all those things programmatically in the app as well. So let's try that. As a first step, I'm going to go back and fix my application. And this is interesting, and I'm going to do it at this point, because you'll see where I was caught. So here I am. I'm on the ADFS server. And I've opened up the Relying Party Trust for the app that I built. If I click on the Endpoint tabs, you'll see an address here. And it says, Endpoint type WS Federation binding post URL HTTPS federated identity .cloud .net. So if you remember, the first time I was up here and I pressed F5, we got that strange half a page that looked like my app out on the cloud. So guess what I didn't do? I didn't tell ADFS I was running in the development environment, not using my production URL. And so here you can see the endpoint. Now, if I put in the URL for the dev application, that redirection should all now work for me. And this is the kind of stuff. Where did I go wrong? I used to be in Scala. OK. So this is the kind of complexity that I was trying to allude to, and how you must think and plan carefully ahead. And these are the working issues that you'll run into. And so in general, my advice is think about each version of that application as a separate relying party. Think about each version having a trust to perhaps a different STS, and keep your models separate. Now, let's just press F5 to prove my point. OK, finally. So now you can see the top left hand corner, it's my name and an email address that we pulled from that Active Directory. So let's think about now 
How can we deal with this dynamic configuration thing? Back to my web config file for my app. Here you can see a section called service. Well, the Windows Identity Foundation allows you to have multiple services defined in its configuration section. So what I'm going to try to do here is to get that app to switch on the fly. And so one of the things that I can do here is say name equals, and we'll call this one production. And now you could imagine, I'll do it quickly, I can add another STS reference. So I can refederate this app to a different STS. So let's call this one staging.federated identity. These are days when you wish you'd picked a shorter name. <laughs> so I'm going to use an existing SDS. Now I'm actually going to use the same SDS. Hopefully it'll find my fed metadata a little quicker. But because I use a different application URI when I went into the fed util tool, that's the name that is sent across to the SDS. That's how the SDS recognizes where the token is going. So, that's our fed metadata. Disable search chaining. I'll put some encryption on here. I'm going to choose a different certificate this time. I'll choose the staging one. So what we should find here is my original name production app and another service section here. So FedUtil just adds a default service section. So what I'm going to do with this one, I'm going to give this one a name as well. So so now I have one called production and one called staging. I need to somehow teach my app which one it's using. So in the csdef file for Windows Azure, you get to define your own configuration settings. So I'm going to create a setting here, which I'll call environment. Oops. And inside the cscfg, now remember, when you build this package and you deploy it up to Azure, there's one file you get to change, one file outside the package. The one file outside the package is the cscfg file. So in here, I'm going to specify that variable and I'm going to say that we are in staging. Let's close this down. Okay, now I need a mechanism to let me switch between environments here. So I'll take my web role project here and I'm going to add a component. I'll add my global application class. In the app start event, I'm going to say Pick up that static federated authentication object which represents the Windows Identity Foundation. I'm going to pick up this service configuration created event. Okay, so when WIF is initializing here, it fires this event to say, hey, I've just loaded a configuration. By default, it loads the unnamed service configuration. So I'd like to fix that and get it to do something else. So let's have a string, which is our environment. So this is part of the Windows Azure 
runtime services. This allows me to query the configuration settings, those environment variables that I effectively set in my CSCFG file. So I'm going to pick up one particular value, and I'd like to get the value of environment. And having got that, I'm going to change WIFS configuration. So. So let's try running this app and this time we'll see what we get. Remember I set that environment variable in the csdef file, I defined it there, I set it in the CS CFG file and said I would like to run a staging, I'm going to try and pick up this event and see what's happening. Step across that. Now it knows my environment is staging. Now I can ask the Windows Identity Foundation, please go and instantiate that blob of service configuration that has the name staging, and then use that as your configuration. So at this point, my app has changed its name. And you can see that because I didn't finish up that configuration at ADFS, it says, I don't know who you are. So the real goal here was, Given a simple or relatively simple web application that you need to push from dev to staging to production, you can put multiple WIF configurations inside one web config file. You can point at multiple SCSs. You can use different certificates. You could have different claims generation rules. I can take this app with those, pack, with those three sections in, and I can push it up to staging, and I can change my CSCFG file to say you're staging. And then I can flip it across to production and change my CSCFG file and say you're production. And the cool thing about that is I didn't rebuild any of my code. If I really care about proving that the staging code is the same stuff I'm running in production, I don't want to rebuild it. And that's what allows me to do that. OK, well, I spent most of this time talking about web single sign-on using WIF and ADFS 2.0. But of course, WIF and ADFS do WCF as well. And at one point, I showed you that ADFS configuration dialog. And you saw all that myriad endpoints, which is part of the design of WCF. Every different authentication type, every different security model creates another endpoint. So ADFS 2 servers tend to have a lot of endpoints. We, I sent one of the testers on a mission. Take every security binding you can find in WCF and make it work in Azure and prove that it works. And he went off and did that. Um, one thing you will need to know if you work with WCF is you'll need this particular KB article number. Um, if you look that up, it will take directly to a download. This is a patch for WCF. Um, I wonder if anybody's run into it already. WCF is pretty good at generating wisdom, web services description language. When you point at a WCF service and you run a tool called Service Util, it gets back all this metadata stuff. And inside there is a list of all the endpoints. Well, WCF as is uses the physical host name. If you point that thing at a web farm, the whistle you get back points to the node you happen to hit in the web farm. This patch fixes that to use the HTTP header. So now I get web services description language, which is the external name of my farm. That KB is actually available for Windows 2008 and for Vista now, and Windows 7 should be the end of the month. Windows 2008 R2, end of the month. Um, obviously, with WIF, you can build STSs, identity providers, federation providers. As Vittorio said, that's a non-trivial task. It makes it seem like it's simple with a few templates inside WIF and Visual Studio. But, but trust me, having built several STSs, it's a pretty complex task. What we did do is go and prove that all of that worked. And what we did was say, huh, if I'm a federation provider and an identity provider and I know about a range of apps, I need to store that configuration information. And we managed to store that stuff in, in SQL Azure uh, and in Azure Storage. And one thing to bear in mind, um, how many people have played with the certificate store as part of Windows Azure? OK, there's a great temptation here. This stuff is all about certs. If I know about you, then I know your cert so I can encrypt for you. 
And the temptation is to say, oh, okay, what I need to do is stick that in the cert store inside Windows Azure. That's probably not a good plan. These relationships, these trusts, we form are fairly dynamic. And so, given that it's just the public part of your certificate, it's perfectly legitimate for me to stick that way in the database behind my STS. Um, I should, one of the guys wrote a very complex app. He ran an, a federation provider, an identity provider, a front end service, a back end service, all things running in Azure, all doing act as an identity delegation between them all. And we didn't change any of the product code. This was all configuration based stuff and a few of the techniques that I've shown you. The real summary here is that WIF lets you externalize authentication. It also lets you externalize authorization. It lets you federate with identity providers and take your stuff out of your app, and it lets you program with claims. And ADFS opens up AD itself for federation, so it does a bunch of protocols, active and passive. It can do intranet and extranet, and it does smart claims generation. The real thing, as I said at the beginning here, despite my failure in a demo, was to show you that the programming model that I used for WIF here, absent those extra techniques that I warned you of, the things that you'll need specifically, is exactly the same as doing WIF on-premise. If you've already learned about WIF and you've already played around with it, the stuff to build an app to run in Windows Azure or to run on-premise is all the same. It all just works the same way. The tooling all works the same way. Then add on the techniques that I told you about to deal with the fact that Azure is a farm. Um, other identity sessions, most of these are now done. Um, Justin is coming along after me to talk about REST security services uh, with the access control service. Of course, I'd like you to fill out an eval. And there's some more on channel nine. And there's a few minutes over, three minutes. I'm happy to take some questions. Um, certainly, the identity guys are out inside the, the Microsoft booth. They have a hands-on lab running there. I'd like to encourage you to go play with that. Um, I will be out there all day tomorrow, so you can come and ask me questions. If you haven't seen this book, it's a preview, a guide to claims-based identity and access control. There's lots of copies of that. That's really worth grabbing a copy of to get a good sound overview of how all this claims-based stuff fits together. Thank you.